I mean, of all, of all the thing, I think his heart is in dharma, and that's where he connects very well. So, with that, uh, I'll let Virin uh, take the podium. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction, Vijay Prabhuji. Yes, um, back in 2001, I was in Germany and suddenly I got this email inviting me to India. And it turned out it was from you, Vijay. And that began my, in this lifetime at least, my um, direct interaction and service with the Indian uh, Hindu activist community. And also I wanted to touch on a personal note I just found out the other day with Bala Bhadra Prabhu because my family is from Atlanta, Georgia. And back in the eighties, my great grandmother was passing away and my uh, mother couldn't make it to Atlanta. So she asked Bala Bhadra Prabhu if he could go visit her in the hospital. And so you went there and you brought her some garlands, prasadam and you chanted to her. And after you left, she was like, those are the nicest people I've ever <laughs> met. And, and basically she ended her life hearing the holy names, thanks to oh. your affectionate kindness. So that for me, that's real important to talk about those personal touches because that's actually the bread and butter of our, our lives. You know, we can be intellectual, all this stuff. We could be activism, political, intellectual. But really what even touches the heart, even we find with Krishna and Vrindavan is those kind of personal things. So I want to thank you for that. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, thank you. I never even knew that till I did yesterday. <laughs> wow. So, um, so the topic today, and also want to offer my respects to you um, doing the technical side of this presentation and also to all the guests who are tuning in. Thank you for this opportunity. So the topic is India and its uh, significance, both ancient and modern. And it's a huge topic. And um, a lot of these points, uh, people in the know, it will not be new information for them. But what I'm hoping with this presentation is that I can share some information which is applicable and verifiable and that can be shared with people of, of good conscience. Because what we're having right now is the narrative is being controlled by people who have an animosity towards India, towards Vedic culture and traditional cultures. And so most of the people in the world, from my experience, no matter where they are, are good hearted, but they're misinformed. And so if you hear these horrible narratives that have been developed, not just recently, we're talking, I think about a good uh, almost 300 years now, there's been this uh, narrative bashing India, you know, finding these, um, these faults that develop in any human society, you know, as time goes by things atrophy and they'll look at that and they'll point to that and, and uh, cynically and inaccurately and dishonestly claim that that's a true example of Indian culture, of Hindu civilization. So I'm hoping to address uh, these points so that um, we can, you know, percolate this information. And because um, I feel a lot of times it's very important, of course, we preach to the choir a lot, which is good because we need to inspire the, the community, especially when we have such a burden of negativity dumped on them and it's heart rending. And so what I'm hoping is that if we can get information out that isn't based on faith or belief, but on verifiable facts then we can wake up good-hearted people of conscience to see what real India has represented and what it does represent and what it will represent to the world at large. So going back to the um, ancient times, um, I mean, I'm not going to go, because when I say ancient with our community, that could be like thousands and thousands of years, but I'm going to go back to just about, you know, 2,500 years or so. But um, we find that India always captured the imagination of the ancient people. And so um, Alexander the Great, of course, he had this uh, Greek mission that he adopted him and his father, King Philip, to uh, you know, give comeuppance to the Persian empire for um, you know, the history, the animosity they had with each other. And, but 
it wasn't that just wasn't his goal because he kept going and of course people say oh he's a militant conqueror yes that's a fact but he was also very spiritually minded and he had heard about india he had heard about the wisdom and the wealth and the treasure of india and so he was driven to go there and one of the proofs we have that he wasn't just a cynical megalomaniac you know despite obvious faults he had was when he did get to india he basically heard about different sages and yogis. And so he went, um, he was immediately interested in these, these uh, seers. So he went out of his way to try and make contact with them. And um, I don't remember all the exact details, but um, he heard about this one sage who was very famous in the region. This is in the current region of Pakistan, modern Pakistan now. And so he um, <clears throat> heard about this sage so then he sent an emissary, said, oh, you know, I would like that sage to come meet me. And so the emissary goes to see the sage and the sage is like, he's a, um, you know, a very advanced soul. So the emissary is like, oh, the great king of the world is, is wants, wants you to come see him, right? And then the sage is like, uh, he's one of those like Nakababas, I think. He, he, he meditated without clothes covered in ashes. So he told, he says, I, I'm meditating. If the king is so interested in me, he, he knows where I am now. Tell him to come here. And if, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it went even deeper than that because um, the sage said, not only that, if, if Alexander is serious about learning from me, he needs to come here naked with straw grass in his teeth, you know? And um, so I've heard one version that, um, rather than Alexander doing it, actually the emissary who was one of his top representatives agreed to that. Because I mean, the Greeks already had this thing, they didn't have like body shame, so they jumped, they'll do sports naked, swim naked, whatever, so it was not a biggie, but bowing down on your, your face to the ground with straw in your teeth was a big move for them. And he did it, and some say Alexander actually did that. And either case, um, it was either Alexander or that great general was one of his top reps who did that. And then Alexander was so impressed with the sage, he accepted him as a spiritual master. And that sage joined Alexander and went all the way back to Babylon with him. And um, there's more details to that. And then there's another wonderful story when Alexander, Srila Prabhupada told this story a lot. When Alexander was in India, one um, thief was captured. And so the, uh, Alexander, the thief was brought to Alexander, the king for judgment. And Alexander like confronted him and was like, why are you, you know, engaged in thievery? What is this? You know, this is criminal activity. And then the thief, you know, being a, a Sanatani at heart might sound funny, but it's a fact. He looked at the king, not just the king. This is a world conquering, most powerful man in the world could have you killed in a second. He looked at him without any fear and he says, yes, I'm a thief but you are, you are the biggest thief in the world because I might steal a few bangles here and there, some food, but you steal whole countries and you usurp the local leadership and you establish yourself as the leader. And Alexander was stunned by this and he saw the truth and the Vedic wisdom of this thief's statement. And so he immediately, he agreed with him and said, yes, and he uh, forgave the thief. And so, um, there's so many more details of uh, Alexander's adventures or misadventures in India. But um, then moving forward in history, we have another world famous great conqueror, Julius Caesar. And um, anyone who's familiar with his history, he ended up in Egypt. And when he got there, there was Cleopatra and her brother were at war with each other for the throne of Egypt. And so there was a struggle to try and gain his allegiance in support of their claim to the throne of Egypt. And as also just, you know, the connecting thing here is also Alexander. Uh, Cleopatra was a direct descendant of Alexander's top general, Ptolemy. And um, so she was very familiar with the history of India and what India's value and as both a place of um, material wealth and treasure, but also as a place of wisdom. And so what was the key ingredient that um, convinced Julius Caesar to support Cleopatra, right? Because he was, you know, he could have any woman. He had so many women, so it wasn't like he was hurting for female companionship. 
But what it was is when she turned to him, because she's offering all these reasons why he should support her claim to the throne. And what finally convinced him when he said, I know the route to India like that. And so immediately he's like, OK, right. And again, perhaps Julius Caesar didn't have altruistic motives, but still it showed the value of what India meant to the most powerful person on the planet at the time. And um, and again, these ancient people, despite their um, you know questionable acts like killing thousands of people, enslaving people, they had a very mystical bent, right? And when they were confronted with truth, they accepted it. And so India has been famous throughout history as a source of, of truth and wisdom and learning, and also as the most um, economically powerful. Uh, place on the planet in terms of economic output, food production, gems, treasure, diamonds, gold, etc. And so India's always had this place in the history of the world. And so then um, we also go back to Cyrus, which actually predates Alexander. And the Greek name for him is actually Kairos. And then in this English, we pronounce, mispronounce it as Cyrus. But what did he call himself? He called himself Kurus. And he said, I'm an Aryan, the son of Aryans, right? And so as we know, this is pure direct Vedic terminology and names, right? And so, you know, the, there, well, actually Persia and India never had like, um, until like the past thousand years, an, uh, animosity or inimical relations. And they looked at each other, you know, India's role was recognized by the ancient Persians. And then there's one story of Semiramis, the uh, Assyrian queen, and some say she's a myth, but whether it's a myth or not, like her history is so, um, India is at the center of it again. And she was another person. And so what I'm saying is even if it's mythology, still India was so um, enamored, the imagination captured the imagination of the ancient people that her attempts to get to India where she, according to the legend, she was actually defeated when she tried to invade India and it was the only place she was defeated. And again, it was like India was smack dab in the center of her whole legend. Because in, even like I said, even if it's a fake a mythology, still it like immediately triggered people's curiosity and intrigued them, oh, India, okay. And so then um, jumping forward, I could talk so many ancient things, but um, I don't have much time. But jumping forward, let's go to the uh, about 550 years ago. And then um, after the Reconquista of Spain and Portugal, like um, I'm convinced that they had access to maps that through the um, Islamic, because as you know, Spain and Portugal were ruled by the Muslims for about a 700 years. And so they had a direct link to India because they knew about the secret of the trade winds. They knew you could get on a boat in the Gulf of the, what they call the Persian Gulf now. And at the right time of year, just get on the boat with all your goods or whatever, you get to India, stay, wait till the trade winds change, going back towards the West, get on the boat with all your goods from India. So the, for, for centuries, the Muslims had that direct link to India. And as we know, they got the knowledge of zero, the so-called Arabic numerals, the pretty the pure Sanskrit pretty much. And um, so when uh, the Christians reconquered Spain and Portugal, they suddenly had access to all this information. And so Columbus, right, he had this maps, I'm convinced, and that's how he came. And he thought he didn't know about the Americas. So he decided, I'm going to go to India based on this knowledge that we now have from the uh, former rulers of Spain and Portugal. And so, again, this story of Columbus is another very important example to um, expose the bias and also the importance of India and history. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm really intrigued by the, what they call the age of exploration, the age of discovery, you know, these people meeting each other, whether it's like when the Westerners first got to India, when they first got to the Americas, first got to Africa. And there are so many in the beginning, they were like blown away. And so the more, the further you go back, the more honest some of these uh, records are about what they found in those countries. And so we'll find that Columbus, like he does his voyage, gets to America. 
But if you like, I don't know how many times I've heard people, you know, discuss this great scholars, you know, just uh, historic, uh, you know, what do you call them? People, um, not, I guess, amateur historians, you know, put YouTube videos up. And what they do is they'll direct, I heard a guy the other day, he's like, so Columbus, he was seeking to get to China and Japan. And then when he got there, he called them Indians. I'm like, come on, that doesn't even make sense. If he, if he thought he was coming, if he was looking for China or Japan and he got to where he thought was China and Japan, it makes more sense he would have called them, you know, Chinese or Japanese people. But instead he called them Indians. And to this day, there's been this effort to try and erase that name from the natives of America. But I have worked personally with a lot of uh, native activists and leaders and not one of them uses the term Native American. I mean, if anyone wants proof, I have videos of interviewing the chief of one of the major tribes in Oregon. And he just constantly says, our Indian people, the people are Indian tribes, you know? So they, they recognize, and I think that's because they recognize the value of India themselves. And they're happy and proud to identify with that. And so we find um, again and again, um, India is central, and this is more to the ancient times. So moving forward in time, like if we were to take a checklist or what I prefer to call a wish list of the uh, mainstream modern narrative, where they're always talking about diversity, democracy, environmentalism, protecting the animals, right? India has been, it's been a natural part of Indian civilization and culture for thousands and thousands of years. They didn't have to learn this in some college or some think tank and some intelligence agency giving them talking points before they were active like most of today's you know, environmentalists and activists. You know, there was an intrinsic part of their, of being part of Sanatan culture of Hindu Dharma. It was a natural part of it. And so let's take the environmental movement. Um, there's that movement in the 70s, it was called Andolan, something Andolan in North Himachal Pradesh, I believe. And they had all these um, uh, trees were gonna be cut down. And uh, the local woman, who most of them probably didn't even know how to read, basically decided we're gonna save these forests and began literally hugging the trees. And that was in the 1970s, but I was intrigued to learn that actually about almost 300 years ago, there was a uh, Bishnoi tribal lady named Amrita Devi in the Rajasthan area. And in this tradition, trees were a central part of their faith and religion and spiritual practice. And so the king, unfortunately, he was actually a Hindu king, decided he, was, and he needed some green wood. So he sent his troops to go cut down the trees in this village. And um, when Amrita Devi heard that, she's like, no way, this is our, our goddess, our gods, these are our deities. So she immediately went and begged them not to cut the trees down. And then the soldiers are like, hey, we have no choice, it's our duty. And so she literally went to the tree and embraced it and hugged it and said, well, you're gonna have to go through me. And unfortunately they did and they cut her head off. And then when her three daughters saw what happened, they immediately went and started trying to protect the trees and they were killed. And then when the word spread, the whole Bishnoi tribe in the region came to her defense. But unfortunately, they weren't armed compared to the military that showed up. And so about almost 400 of the Bishnoi um, people were killed in the name of, and not in the name of, but in the act of trying to save their environment, right? And so I look at people today and, you know, they have, you know, they talk a good talk and all that, but I don't, I doubt anyone in history has basically put their lives on the line up and maybe until recent times, I think some in Brazil have actually emulated this, but I'm talking about 300 years ago. And again, these ladies weren't educated, supposedly, you know, mundane educated. They weren't like, you know, triggered by something they read on social media or they weren't triggered by the latest fad of being green and all that. They knew what was right and they were ready to die for it and they did die for it. So there's no one who's as in, um, important activists or a protector of the environment than these Hindu community tribal people, right? It's again, it was, it's a part of the natural part of their um, culture and environment. It wasn't an artificial imposition like, oh, we need to start caring. 
It was like they were born and raised that way from generation after generation, right? So we got that checklist, the environmentalists. No one's been a better environmentalist than the natives of India, the Hindu communities. And then we look at diversity, right? Again, nobody in history has been as diversity, uh, diverse as Indian culture, right? And to the point as we have about, I think 56 Islamic nations in the world, but there's only one country in the world that has all, all I think 73 schools of Islam represented in one country. It's India. It's not officially a Muslim country, despite having, you know, as a large Muslim population, but every school of Islam is represented in India. And then we go to the Jewish, uh, the, the tragic history of the Jewish people in human history. And again, where have the uh, Jewish people never been persecuted? Where have they been allowed to thrive? Where have they been unquestionably allowed to practice their religion? India, again, then let's look at the Parsis, one of the most ancient traditions and religions in the world. Again, where do you find most of the Parsis today? Not in their original home of Persia, which Parsi comes from the word, where? India, again. So people have all these narratives trying to demonize India trying to demonize Hindu ethos, the Hindu outlook. But if you look at the facts, the verifiable facts, not just me, you know, I'm not just being, you know, using hyperbole here. I challenge anyone to look up every point I'm making, research online, and you'll find it's all true, valid information, historical events that really took place. So again, let's look at, oh, we're always, the West is always, oh, democracy and freedom. Nobody's been more democratic than the native cultures of India, right? So even if you go back to what they call mythology, when we had 5,000 years ago, Maharaj Yudhishthir was declared emperor of the world. Never did he step into local government and assert his will. The Vedic form of, um, um, you know, what would you call it? Global governance was that you never stepped in unless there was a problem that was not it was unsolvable at the local level. And only then was local leadership um, put aside because obviously they're not able to, they're not capable enough to solve the problem. And that's when the imperial authorities would step in. And so this, this is real democracy where people are allowed to live and let live. And then even today, the village Panchayat level, and you go to Pakistan, they still have the same system. Go to Nepal, Sri Lanka, I believe. And that's all Indian civilization. And another important point I wanted to say is we can say ancient civilization. Yeah, that's a fact, but a point that's missing is we need to understand it's ancient high civilization. Why? Because you look at the impact of the people on this, the world around them. And, and then, um, oh, another important point about, you know, animal protection. We hear all this paint, pet, peta or whatever, and, you know, animals and all that. And name one country in the world that has over a billion people that still has lions, tigers, elephants, leopards, every langur monkeys, you know, regular monkeys, uh, the rhesus monkeys they're called. I mean, all kinds of king cobras, uh, garial crocodiles, uh, all kinds of wild deer. I mean, Somehow this country in India is not one of the, it's a, it's a big country, but it's not as large as quite a few other countries. Yet it has so many people in this kind of relatively small geographical location, but somehow manages to allow all the wildlife to thrive and survive. And then I haven't studied it, but I know the only remaining Asian lions that were once found from Greece all the way to probably, um, I don't know if they made it to Burma, they're only found in one forest now in Gujarat, right? And I would like to see a study as to how the lions in India died off to the point of only surviving in that forest. And I, I, I wouldn't be surprised to know that a big part of it was when the British brought that Western hunting tradition. You know, uh, man is the master of all. And you see these horrible pictures of these guys with their foot on some dead, beautiful lion holding their gun like some total jerk, you know? And so I know a lot of, um, you know, people, they see power and they saw the British are empowered, obviously, and they start trying to emulate them. And so I'm convinced, because um, I think the cheetahs, they were just brought back to India 
but how did they get killed off? And I read somewhere that some local Maharaja like just slaughtered so many cheetahs. And again, it was because he was trying to be more British than the British, you know? So it's like, so, and that's, a, you know, that's a phenomenon we keep finding. And then what's even more egregious is then they'll take um, situations like that have developed, like I said, as time goes by, things atrophy, and they'll point to those um, decayed states of society, and they'll try and use that as a bludgeon to demonize Hinduism. And that's as crazy as coming to someone's home after a tornado hit it, and then saying, oh, this guy's the worst housekeeper I've ever seen, <laughs> you know? And it's like, so you got India, and they were like um, ruled uh, by outsiders like 700 years, and whether we had, you know, noble people like Darasiko, for example, who's one of my favorites. He was actually supposed to be the, inherited the Mughal throne of India and he like helped build Radhakeshwa temple in Mathura. He was friends, I think with Guru Gobind Singh. He actually personally wrote all these books translating the Upanishads into Persian, right? And so um, that's another topic, but the point I'm making is so India was in, and even if we had like uh, good hearted people like Darcyko, look what happened to him. His brother Aurangzeb had him killed, usurped the throne. And because they were coming from an outside mindset, right? So you had people like Aurangzeb. And then after that, we have the um, British rule, which Prabhupada and I also agree with was even more disastrous for India. And there's many ways you can look at it, but one reason is because the Mughal rules and Islamic rule, rulers actually lived there. You know, their capitals were there. You know, they wanted a functional, you know, um, society that they can tax, et cetera. Whereas the British, and there's actually uh, one famous British writer, I think in the 1800s, he said, he said, what the British are doing is they're soaking up the treasures along the banks of the Ganges and squeezing them out into the, the Thames River in England, you know? And so we had a couple hundred years of that depleting of India's resources. And then strangely, under the British, we had this, um, every 20 years, there'd be a famine that would kill off millions of people. And there hasn't been one famine since in, in either uh, Bangladesh, Pakistan, or India since so-called independence. And so this is obviously an intentional um, act in order to uh, reduce the population, break society down so that they'll be more malleable and controllable. And so the point I'm making with all that and, uh, is not to just bash the British, because first of all, it's a very important point, like almost all the information you have exposing the horrific uh, results of British rule in India comes from good hearted British people who had enough and they stood up and they said, this is not right, you know? So this is not about British bashing, this is about truth sharing, right? So we find that these, um, India was traumatized, you know, for centuries. And so the people, when you get in the state of trauma, you know, and your children can't eat and you can't count on the dependability of, of the harvest, right? It can break anyone down. And so a lot of the negative things that developed within society were based on that trauma. And then even then without the British, it's like I said, it's a natural development for things to decay. And that's why Lord Krishna says in the Gita, he says, yada, yada, hi dharmasya. So whenever there's a decline in dharma, he, he descends in order to set the balance right again, right? So that's a natural phenomenon. And so the world is fortunate that with India, we have, an ancient high civilization that's still alive, that's still going. And again, this is not hyperbole. I could prove it in one sentence. Basically imagine if the whole electric grid, the satellite grid, the internet all collapse globally, people in most of the world would be in dire straits and most likely wouldn't survive if it, if it uh, was a prolonged outage, right? But a majority of the people in these Indic regions like India, Pakistan, Nepal, Sri Lanka, would just move on, move along, keep going on as they ever have, because that's those civilization at the root level still surviving, not just surviving. I personally think it's thriving because if you measure your calculations of what thriving means, it doesn't mean being 
so having no self-sufficiency that at the snap of a switch, you're completely locked down into um, dis disempowered from even taking care of yourself, your family or your community, right? Whereas all these villages in the remote parts of the Indic world would mostly survive. And the same goes with Africa as well. And Africa is another topic, but the, the um, I could also, I'm happy to be corrected, but I think the difference with Africa is in this examples I'm giving is that the population base isn't as massive as India in a smaller geographical location. And so in even, that's a whole nother topic, but Africa also has some very um, verifiable Dharmic connections and roots as well, right? And so um, with India, we find all these wish lists of modern society can be fulfilled by turning to the experiential wisdom of the Indian civilization, Hindu wisdom, Vedic wisdom, right? And then another point I wanna talk about is I see, you know, you'll have Guinness Book of World Records, right? And you'll have um, all these uh, record breaking uh, acts, acts and books, et cetera. And so let's say, just for example, let's say that the, um, the whole spiritual angle and the whole uh, Vedic perspective is just faith and mythology. Yet no one can deny that in the history of the world, no one, no civilization anywhere in the world has written such profuse literature, amazing poetry, and not just a book here and there. To this day, no one has written a book longer than the Mahabharata. And even if we take the modern um, speculations that it's only 1200 years old, it's still the longest book ever written in the history of the world, right? And so we look at it from a mundane uh, technical perspective, Hindu civilization's got it all. It's like has the most literature on every topic. It's not, and that's another beauty. It wasn't like just, oh, this is religious only. It was like every aspect of civilization is covered by the Vedic literature. And even if it was written by, you know, some sages living in caves, who just had some vivid imagination. It's still one of the most incredible um, ac uh, accomplishments of humanity, right? Because, you know, we're all on the same planet and uh, we're all humans here. And what I'm saying is India represents the best that humanity has ever achieved, right? So, you know, you look at that, who else has written that kind of literature at such a volum voluminous level on so many varieties of topics? You know, name any topic and they have a scripture on it. They have a treatise on it, right? And no other civilizations accomplished this. And, you know, nowadays, like, um, I personally think it's a great tragedy that China and India are being pitted against each other because I'm convinced that the, uh, there's some powers in China that recognize they got screwed with this whole communist Western um, enforced doctrine upon their civilization. But all through history, China looked to India with honor, with respect. They recognized everything I'm saying about India. They knew and they were proud to be part of India. Same with Japan. And for me, I would love to see the ancient civilizations of Asia, you know, also including Korea, you know, Japan, Korea, China, and India unite. You guys represent the, you know, the most ancient um, ongoing uh, civilizations in the history of humanity. And then the, the other thing people don't understand is even if something's messed up, or let's take, you know, Hitler and Nazism, right? It didn't last that long. I mean, we had to have a war about it. But the fact is, is when something is actually functional, it goes on a generation after generation, right? And so India represents the highest level of functionality in a civilization. And that's why it behooves, it behooves, behooves the world at large, especially people who are sincere about the environment, animal rights, um, minority rights, diversity, democracy, freedom of religion. India has it all and has it all for thousands of years. None of, for the West, this is like, oh, wow, you know, that might be a good idea. And I think they came up with it like 200 years ago. And then to top it off, the main guys who promote that type of stuff, like had owned slaves and stuff like that. So they talk a good talk, but then on the personal level, they're like totally you know, acting in a corrupt manner, you know, and then they'll like quote their Bible, whatever, you know, it's all messed up, right? And so I'm just, I'm issuing a challenge to the world at large, to all sincere people 
Like if you're genuinely sincere about saving the planet, if you're genuinely sincere about minority rights, if you're genuinely sincere about freedom and democracy and the right of the individual to stand up to the government, there's been no better track record than the Vedic civilization, the Hindu civilization in India, right? There's like that one amazing story. Again, even if it's mythology, it's still a direct um, example of the ethos and the value that was at the heart of Indian civilization. And we have that story of when King Ugrasena uh, was king in Dwarka, then that one Brahmin, every time one of his babies was born, it would, it would be stillborn, right? And so he immediately went to the king. And according to Vedic tradition, such a thing, it might sound crazy, but that was considered the king's responsibility if a family couldn't safely bring children to the world. And so this Brahmin, he had no political power. He had, he had I doubt, I, Brahmins usually don't have money. He didn't have a lobby group or anything, but he was able to walk into the king's royal court and directly challenge him and directly tell the king, you are a failure, right? And whether that was an unjust accusation or not, it pinpoints and highlights the true value, uh, the true value Vedic civilization gave to the individual, right? And so again, I just wanna emphasize that if you're sincere and serious about bettering this planet, if you're sincere about bettering the human condition, if you're sincere about saving the helpless, if you're sincere about protecting the animals, if you're sincere about true uh, equal rights, democracy, and freedom, then we have, the world is fortunate to have a template, a functional template that's based on experiential wisdom of thousands of years. And India still has that for us. And we're coming up on question and answer time. So I just want to close by saying, there's this phenomenon, unfortunate phenomenon, where yes, India, there were many other ancient wonderful civilizations like the Mayan, right? The Incas, right? And, you know, in Zimbabwe, ancient Egypt, all these amazing civilizations, right? But for some reason or another, they didn't survive up till the modern age, right? So what we'll find is all these anthropologists are so keen on understanding ancient civilization and then they ignore the only surviving ancient civilization that will give answers to every question they have about the ancient ways and ancient religion and ancient traditions. So just for example, the world's leading scholar in ancient Babylonian religion, Dr. Walter Sommerfeld from the University of Marburg in Germany, he directly said, we cannot go to ancient Babylon and modern Iraq to experience the ancient religious festivals of that region. And he said, the only way you can experience those uh, festivals today in this modern era is you need to go to Pori, to Jagannath Pori and attend Rath Yatra festival. And if you go there, you will get a firsthand experience of what was going on three, 4,000 years ago in Babylon. So even someone who's not into faith, but you're just a history buff, you're just a history buff, what, what better tool can you use to access the ancient world by going to the only living civilization that still continues those traditions. So in every angle you look at it, India is a wonder. India is the answer and India has the solutions. And these people demonizing India, these people demonizing the Hindu revival movement and trying to demonize the term Hindu nationalists are actually um, either highly misinformed, brainwashed, which a lot of people are unfortunately, or they're directly inimical, not just towards India, but the entire human race. Because by demonizing the only civilization that has the solutions to all our problems, you're, you're denying humanity access to those solutions. So when they attack Hinduism, when they attack India, they're attacking the future stability and well-being of the entire world, humanity, the animals, the environment. So we need to, we need to stand up and point all these uh, facts out and reach people who understand, you know, that we can save the world literally by turning to India. Thank, so thank you. Thank you, Vrind Prabhu. Thank you very much. A very inspiring talk. Uh, we have some questions. I think, Prakashi, you can switch them on, all of them. Uh, can you see the chat, Vrind? 
The first question is from Deepankar Ji. They you briefly spoke, pop up, but I'm not sure how to. Yeah, I, I'll, 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 talk, uh, I'll read it. You spoke about narrative challenge in the beginning of your talk. Can you discuss more specifically about current challenges being faced by Hinduism and how should contemporary Hindus meet them? Um, I think you said. Um, uh, sorry. Yeah, Dipangaji, can you, do, do you want to ask that. directly? Dipangaji, you can ask that. Yeah, yeah. So I know in the beginning of your talk, you talked about you know the the narrative challenges and how it's been going on for a long time you know it's not recent it's been going on for 3 400 years but i think at this point uh, my uh, interest is in understanding that what we're going through right now today in the current age what are some of the patterns and trends that you're seeing uh, in terms of the narrative challenges uh, in in the recent developments and how should uh, uh, people who are sympathetic to Hinduism, who who really are, you know, uh, believe in the core philosophies, uh, how should they challenge it, and how should they fight that? Well, um, it's kind of a broad question, but I'll try and answer. Um, I think one of the current modern challenges we're having is the um, intentional and dishonest attempt to misportray. Um, nationalism as some negative. The fact is, is nationalism is about keeping your own house in order. So if I have a home and I have neighbors with their homes and I'm focusing on keeping my home clean, tidy, functional, that doesn't mean I have no care or liking for my neighbors, right? So at the core, that's what nationalism is about. It's about keeping your own house in order. It has nothing to do with hating others or minimizing the uh, contributions of other members of your community, right? So I feel that that's a huge challenge that I personally think needs to be addressed a lot better. It's like, you know, you know, on a broader level, nationalism for any country is a healthy thing, right? Because you're doing the best for your people that are residing there and the best for the country. And has nothing to do with like, you know, taking down your neighbors. Right. And then it's even more egregious when we um, apply that kind of fascistic um, hate mongering label to the Hindu nationalists, because, like I said, the value of Hindu civilization is obvious to any honest researcher that what does Hindu nationalism mean to me? It basically means repairing the atrophied parts of the culture and the civilization and looking at the mistakes of the past and confronting them. Right. And I also know the RSS and, um, uh, you know, other organizations related are actively doing all that. Right. And so but there's like a, such a burden of demonization against them that they the terminologies are being thrown at them. And so I feel like that's the huge challenge right now is to combat the negative narrative with facts that are logical. Right. And provable and not just based on the emotional, well, I love India, hmm. and, you know, and Hinduism's my religion, like it or leave it. That's just, it doesn't fly, you know? There needs yeah. to be kind of a direct conscious approach based on logic and mm -hmm. also, you know, love and emotion is a part of it, but it needs to be presented in such a way that your fence sitters who are provided that fact in a, in a you know, a logical manner can instantly see the truth of it. So the truth will speak for itself, but I still feel like one of my favorite things I've ever done in my uh, career in Dharmic activism was when Vijay Prabhu hooked me up with the UK Hindu Today magazine. Uh -huh. And um, we had such great success in there, you know, and getting the Hindu point across. And to this day, I know the Kauai uh, magazine, but they only went down for four times a year. So still, I'm not impressed with the Hindu media presence. And that's a constructive criticism, not like an attack or anything. They really need to step it up, you know. And, and we also, we need a combination where we're inspiring the community, the choir, so to, you know, so to speak, but we're also touching the heart of good, uh, good uh, sincere people. So that would be the biggest challenge right now, establish a powerful media that's accessible to people who have no or little knowledge of Hinduism in India. 
Okay, thank you very thank much. You. Uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, Araki ji, you have a question. I think you may directly ask. I, I think it's actually very similar. Uh, you know, just you know, how do we attack? How do we correct the the misinformation campaigns that are out there that are so viciously kind of directed at? India and uh, and Hinduism. I think a lot of it's kind of linked to the the politics that are going on in India. Uh, but I guess I'll, I'll ask a different question. Uh, you know, yes. given your research and given you know all your studies and all, what are some of the alliances? I don't think the attacks on Hindus are isolated in any way. I think they're really directed at a few communities around the world. In your opinion, like what are the alliances that Hindus should look to kind of forge? in order to correct a lot of these misinformation campaigns? Um. Well, um, I mean, I mean, right away, obviously we have the sister Dharmic traditions like Buddhist and Jain and Sikhism. And I'm like horrified with the latest stuff, you know, Intel agencies backed and funded Khalistani nonsense, right? And that's like a pretty uh, horrific development as far as I'm concerned. They're like the Sikh, Sikh tradition was developed in order to protect Hinduism in India. So it's like one of the most Kali Yuga twisting of the of reality into weaponizing it against mother India. And so like, yeah, we need to get those Dharmic alliances strong, you know, and, um, and I feel too, like, um, there must be a combination. We can't just be pushovers. So India must be strong militarily, economically, politically. So um, one of the reasons the Islamic world has, you know, gotten such leeway, um, you know, politically in the West is because of the oil, you know, and you know, like that. And also, the you know, the history of the British intentionally allying with them. But the fact is, is um, you know, they don't want to mess with them because they're too integrated into the economies of the world. And so India must always be strong, you know, must always have that Kshatriya strength there and the combination of wisdom, you know, you got my point. So, uh, but the alliances are there, they're waiting and India is so powerful on the material level now, we need to harness these alliances. We need to send ambassadors, you know, like us, um, Sadhguru, I was really happy to see he went on a motorcycle journey, like in the middle of COVID too. <laughs> and he traveled to all these um, American Indian reservations and met all these chiefs. There needs to be more of that. I guarantee you the right spokespeople, we need to start going to powwows. You know, those are <laughs> American Indian gatherings. We need to start representing at all these. And we need to stop looking at these um, tribal communities in Africa and India as some kind of backwards people. No, they're noble civilizations which need Mother India's support. So I, that's directly what I'd say is we need to get with, um, you know, under maybe ICCS has actually done a lot of work, but we need to really uh, pump up their support and visibility. And I, that would be my number one advice on answer to that question. Well, you know, Vrindavan, uh, I just want to share something with you because you mentioned several times about indigenous cultures and, and you specifically mentioned Jagannath Puri. Yeah. And I, I was fortunate to go there in 1982. But here's something from our guru, Prabhupada, that's very yeah. interesting. It says that, um, it's very short. It says, uh, if Western people are expert in techn technological knowledge, and if their natural tendency is to develop it, let them do it. But as far as we Indians are concerned, our people are naturally inclined for spiritual elevation. Therefore, even in these days, also when there is Kumbh Mela at Prayag, or any other place, but there is a particular function in some pilgrimage like Jagannath Puri, Brindavan, Hardwar, etc. Millions of people gather without any advertising. So these natural tendencies should not be disturbed, but the people of a particular section of the world should develop their indigenous talent and then exchange with others. So the Western people may give us their product and we may give them our product. And by such exchanging policy, both of us may flourish in our civilized way of life. That just that just stays with me. It's been actually the motivation for me to do interfaith work and all these different kinds of activities, because we have to recognize the intrinsic spiritual dynamic of all the cultures of the world, especially the indigenous cultures. They have so much to offer. So I, I appreciate what you're saying and how you're working towards that. Now, one last thing is that I was invited to be, to participate in the function in Atlanta years ago. Yeah. And Ted Turner, the founder of CNN, 
He was uh, brought in as a keynote speaker for all the Indian businessmen in Georgia. And you know what he said? Right. Don't ruin your country the way we right. have ruined our country. Right. Your country is so special. Do not ruin your country. I was like, wow. wow. <laughs> so I didn't want to share That's that. <laughs> and I heard him say yeah. it first. Yeah, so just want to say thank you to uh, Vrindavan Prabhuji. Thank you very much. I'm sure Srila Prabhupada is very proud of you for what you've done. Die, Prabhupada. <laughs> and thank yeah. you. Thank you to all the guests who attended and uh, look forward to our next session coming soon. So have a wonderful evening. Hare Krishna. Namaste to everybody. And Vrindavan, oh, stay, stay on for a second, Vrindavan. Food. Yeah.